In the meantime, let's focus our efforts uh, on the election uh, and some of these issues that matter so much to so many of you. I'm talking about the economy as well. The former president, Donald Trump, today uh, vowed to impose a 200% tariff on John Deere's imports. Uh, we'll be talking about what that means, uh, what would that look like if implemented, if Trump wins here. Before we get into that, Trump was in Savannah, Georgia, outlining some of these economic proposals. Fox's Rebecca Castor has more. Let's watch. From a rally in Georgia to the airwaves in Wisconsin, the presidential candidates know how to make headlines. Under my leadership, we're going to take other countries' jobs. We're going to bring thousands and thousands of businesses and trillions of dollars in wealth back to the good old USA. If re-elected, Donald Trump says he'll recruit foreign companies to the U.S. under this pitch. Lower taxes, lower energy costs, and less regulation. And if a business needs land, they can have that too. We will set up special zones of federal land. These will be ideal spots for relocating entire industries that we've taken in from other countries. Trump is staying focused on an issue he leads his opponent on, the economy. Whereas Kamala Harris tops Trump on election integrity, health care, and abortion access. I think we should eliminate the filibuster for Roe. And, and, and we need and get us to the point where we, 51 votes would be what we need to actually put back in law the protections for reproductive freedom. In a taped interview with Wisconsin Public Radio, the vice president outlined how she thinks Roe v. Wade could become the law of the land again by encouraging the Senate to get rid of a centuries-old procedural roadblock. What we are talking about is a simple procedure to allow um, the, whenever rights are taken away from someone that the U.S. Senate can, without, without being blocked by a filibuster, be able to restore those rights. Trying to close the gap with Donald Trump, Kamala Harris is planning to unveil more of her economic ideas to voters this week. In Washington, Rebecca Castor, Fox News. Rebecca, thanks so much. Uh, in the meantime, let's talk about some of these economic proposals. Of course, Vice President Harris will be in Pittsburgh later this week outlining some more of them. Donald Trump talking about some of them today in Savannah. To reiterate, he vowed to impose a 200% tariff on John Deere's imports if the company continues with its plan to move some of its production to Mexico. The idea, though, is stirring, of course, some controversy, although some support it as well here. Others say, though, it will make things more expensive for the everyday American. Let's talk about tariffs and how the market is responding and reacting to this with none other than our friend there at Barron's, uh, Al Root. He joins me. Um, Al, good to see you here. Um, you know, this is Trump's economic playbook, uh, tariff everything uh, under the sun. Uh, and even American companies like John Deere, long and storied and historic company, as well. This reminds me of some of the Harley Davidson uh, tariff fights back during the Trump administration here. A 200% tariff. Is that plausible? How do you tax something that high? Um, well, so, I mean, you can do so. So, there's a few things about this. So, um, you know, if you look at Deer stock today, the stock closed off. Um, so, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, in theory, now that there was more of an offhand comment, I think, than, than a full policy discussion, but, you know, this would apply to whatever was coming out of Mexico, which is actually very small. You know, Deere is very quick to point out they have 60 facilities in the U.S. and 30,000 U.S. workers, and they're really talking about moving, like, lower margin parts or equipment to their Mexican facility which quite frankly is a good business decision now you know if you if you said to me like john deere is going to catch shrapnel on a policy discussion I, I would have been very surprised um don't forget president trump renegotiated nafta right so all of this is is sort of within the realm of what's reasonable uh, a reasonable business decision but so if you put you know the 200 percent tariff on it it would basically you know make that an uneconomic decision then you have to bring it back to the u.s now, theoretically, that means, you know, higher costs for deer, higher prices for deer consumers. I think there's a couple of things that, you know, you know, I want to point out. There's there's a lot of situations where tariffs make some good sense. But, you know, some of these sorts of ideas with your allies 
it actually, and with people with free trade agreements, it actually some at some point it starts to be counterproductive and then it starts to be a competitive issue, right? Like if deer can't manufacture in low cost areas where we have existing trade agreements, then it really risks losing market share to people that have lower cost bases. But the overall impact on deer, super small, which is fine. Okay, yeah, and, and you know, for the viewers, I mean, we are hypothetically talking about this in yep. theory here, uh, and we'll have to wait and see if Trump is uh, elected again, what he does uh, on the economic front. I mean, he has said as much here uh, that the tariff threat is alive and real. So if he is successful, what's the positive net benefit um, for consumers, businesses buying John Deere's products? Is there one? A benefit? There's no real benefit. Okay. Um, so, the, you know, tariffs in general are, you know, good when maybe somebody's competing unfairly, stealing IP, when, a, when, a, when an industry is dumping something in your country that's selling below uh, the market price that they sell domestically. All of those reasons make sense. When you're and, and, and there are good reasons to want to manufacture things in the U.S., cars, John Deere, tractors, all that sort of thing. So sometimes a reasonable tariffs can make sense in, in that situation. But when you're talking about like, no, we're not going to let you bring, you know, this cab, you know, this top of a tractor in from Mexico, we're going to charge you for that. It really only, um, uh, you know, raises the price for deer consumers. Now, you know, it could keep, you know, hundreds of jobs out of those 33,000 maybe in the U.S., but okay. they'd probably be doing other things. So that's a benefit for that community. Yeah. But on balance, tariffs tend to raise prices, which is okay, just so long as you understand the trade-off might be higher employment in a certain region. I yeah. feel like some of the policy discussions, we're unwilling to say that there's any negative instead of, oh no, I've lost my headphone. Instead <laughs> of saying- That's okay, you're animated. Oh, instead of saying that, okay, this is one of the things that would be an that would be an implication of this, but we're willing to make that trade off for the benefits in employment. Um, but but in this instance, it pretty just means you know farmers would face a little bit more pr uh, of a higher price for you know a low end tractor. Right, um, Al. I want to remind the viewers uh, with this soundbite we're about to play uh, of what was maybe still is in some corners of the Republican Party a traditional establishment conservative view on tariffs. This is Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Former President Trump has proposed a 200% tariff on John Deere tractors if they're made in Mexico. Are you concerned that some of these tariff proposals by the GOP now may be drive up costs for consumers or for urban exporters in Kentucky, for example? Yeah, I'm not a fan of tariffs. They've raised the prices for American consumers. I'm more of a free trade kind of Republican that uh, remembers how many jobs are created by the exports that we engage in. So I'm not a tariff fan. All right, so Al McConnell's saying he's not a tariff fan here. Um, but when did both political parties embrace the notion and the idea of tariffs. You have, to, you have this small segment and sliver of the Republican Party still saying what McConnell is saying, but it seems like both parties are all in on the tariff wars. Yeah, I think that's true. Now, the problem, and it, it sounds cynical, I think it's it's partly a function of, of the need to win. Uh, the election and refusing to seat ground um, to your opponent. Now, I think you rightly pointed out at the beginning, Trump definitely uh, is, is more popular and seen as more capable on economic issues. Um, and, and so I think one of his uh, strategies is to make sure that he doesn't see any of that ground to his opponent. And I think that's when you get into these sorts of things. And then I think you just look at the electoral map. I know we've talked um, recently about steel, right? Pennsylvania, big swing state. Yeah. Very important to maintain uh, leads in that state and win that state on both sides. So you get into this ever escalating, um, uh, well, if you say 10%, then I say 15%. Well, if you say 15%, I'll say 20%. And, um, you know, overall, you know, there's, there's, you know, pluses and minuses on both sides, right? But, you know, lower taxes, free trade, and maintaining some of your manufacturing base, like I'm an industrial guy, I'm never going to argue that Mitch is totally right, 
because if you go back to semiconductors, right? After all of this free trade, we ended up with this tiny island off the coast of China making 90% of the world's most advanced chips, Taiwan Semi. At some point, we probably should have said that might not be the best strategy, so maybe we want to adjust. So there is a role for all these discussions, but we're we're in a little bit of silly season right now where we're just escalating promises. Right, because um, if you're John Deere, this historic American company, there's there's so much cultural cachet it carries in the American consciousness. And, and maybe even in that cultural conversation, um, Trump finds many of his constituents, uh, you know, not necessarily working for John Deere, um, but, but associating the, the two here. So why do you think he would want to go after a company like that and really rankle him and threaten them with these tariffs if constituents uh, are pro John Deere of Trump's. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so in the way I read the tea leaves, and certainly I don't I have the president, former president here, he, he really does not like it when um, uh, he sees these announcements of, I'm gonna move this, this set of manufacturing here. He doesn't like it when car companies, you know, announce models or partnerships that, you know, go into Mexico. Uh, um, even though there are, you know, there are, there are tens of thousands of workers in dozens of plants across all of America's Mexico, Canada, and in the U.S., it's just sort of a system that's developed, um, you know, over the last 30, 40 years since that original NAFTA agreement, um, and and he it really rankles him, right? So to some extent, uh, you know what the reaction is going to be when he sees a, uh, an announcement like, okay, we're going to move this part over here, we're going to move this job. Um, uh, and so you almost know that's coming. Yeah. Um, but I think that Deere would say, you know, hey, hey, uh, we understand, you know, we're talking low-end tractors, maybe they're not even sold in the U.S., you know, 33,000 workers. They And even, even for me, right, I'm an industrial guy, I, I have a model tractor that somebody gave me at some point, like Deere is, you know, 50% of their sales to U.S. farmers, they make it here. They are in this global world as close to as an American product as you can get. Okay. Which is good. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave it at that, Al. Uh, always can't thank you enough for your insight into so many of these economic headlines. We'll definitely be speaking again, Al. Thanks.